So, um, Hi, folks. Welcome to ChatGPT, a product review with Equity in Mind. My name is Reed Dixon, and we're going to take a whirlwind tour into the promise and peril of this fantastical tool. Um, as a brief background on what we're doing here, um, I, um, I'm our program manager for Faculty Development Pima Online, and I teach classes with our faculty in educational technology, where we review ed tech tools. And one of the things we need to be thinking about increasingly is, are those technologies that cross over into the classroom that aren't considered ed tech, but do have considerable purpose and use within our classrooms? So um, I will fly through these slides and probably not read as much as I would like to, because we have over 100 slides for the next 40 minutes. But um, the main thing to say is I am glad to be here at Peralta Equity Conference. I am a K-20 educator, identify as such, so I try to connect with K-12 as well as higher ed pieces as we progress. Uh, please, uh, if anything that I say today is interesting to you or you want to continue to share ideas, connect with me on Twitter if possible. Um, my handle is Reed Dixon UX uh, across the different platforms. So why a product review? It's a very um, interesting idea to engage educators in product reviews. To me, one of the things that I've been promoting uh, is that we're engaging in too much with product design with UX, but not pedagogical experience, what I call PX. Uh, we need educators to help inform what's next for the ed tech um, product pathways and uh, roadmaps. And we also need technologies that are outside of ed tech to be more aware about educational use cases or pedagogical use cases. So again, this is not ed tech, but arguably it is because everybody's using it. Um, another key point to keep in mind is that this tool is considered the most disruptive technology that's ever existed. Uh, Sam Altman, the founder of that, was quoted as saying something similar very recently. Um, what does that look like? How does that uh, impact our, our lives, our schools, our writing, our teaching, our learning, our thinking, um, and the workplace that we're preparing our students to enter, where they're going to be expected to use these technologies? Um, again, we do see AI being used for learning and for cheating. I will acknowledge that from the outset. And so as we dig in, we'll try to look at some of those scenarios. Um, right after it came out in November of 2022, I guess it was in December, the Stanford Daily um, new, um, news source said that 17% of their student respondents were using ChatGPT to assist with fall quarter assignments and exams. That's a small percentage. Study.com suggests that 89% are using it to support their homework. 48 are using it to um, support, or excuse me, to address tests or quizzes. Notice I use the word address. Um, and half are using to write their essays. Uh, I just did a round table at Pima Community College where I work, in which one of the faculty members was concerned, especially for entry level classes on the misuse of the tool to, um, to do writing, or um, is this tool, um, potentially interrupting the cognitive work that we're aiming to support our students in our classes? This is a question we need to consider as we move forward. Um, locally, we did our first workshop in January. Um, I reached out to our division heads for sciences and asked about her fact development needs, and she wanted to do a workshop on ChatGPT. So we did something early, and then our local KOLD news station said, we want to come out and talk to you. And they did, um, I want to say the next day. And the frame was chatbot cheating, chatbot cheating. But the reporter, thankfully, brought the angle of, of what do we need to be thinking about as a community, our kids, our families, our schools, given that this technology is here with us and I would say is here to stay. Um, so we presented the positive use case. But during this presentation, I'm going to be engaging you in a review that aims to look at the pros and the cons of the tool to problematize it, et cetera. So um, what is ChatGPT to students? We don't have time to get into this particular talk, but we did a panel for our Pima Online Retreat, um, which, which our focus is on staying ahead of the curve, where our chancellor spoke with our department head, our students, and design leaders from the University of Arizona. And one student featured in this particular video said, 
that he uses it to pose questions like, what does quantum mechanics explain it to me like I'm a seven-year-old? Now explain it to me like I'm a nine-year-old. Now explain it to me like I'm in middle school. Now explain it to me like I'm in high school. Now explain it to me like in college. And each time it phrases it in an increased level of complexity for him. And the way his brain processes as an autistic student, he really appreciated that he could go there at three in the morning and have this kind of guided tour that is increasing in complexity, just like constructivism would support with teaching and learning. Now, is the tool set up to do that? No, but he was able to find creative ways to make the tool do this. So I'm not gonna share this uh, clip of him speaking because of, because of time limits. I wanna, before we dive in too quickly in this quick session, take our AI pulse. So please go to the chat feed if you might. And I'd like to know what three words come to mind for you today when you think of chat GPT. And I, I'll, I'll share back a little bit in the chat feed as it comes through. Again, pros and cons, whatever comes to mind. Uh, I like to do this kind of exercise. We're doing college-wide workshops on this and I'm also doing um, department-based workshops and some folks are excited, some folks are terrified. So here's what we've got coming through. Exciting, frightening, curious, cheating, brain scanning, fear, decreasing critical thinking, fun, disruptive opportunity. Um, please look at what your peers are saying uh, in the chat feed. Reliability, accuracy, hesitant, future, wild learning, disruption, powerful helping. I wanna know about your use case. Whenever I do workshops, I try to begin with asking everyone to log in. So how many people have used this tool so far for any purpose? As a point of context, I did a workshop for parents of fifth graders, a volunteer workshop a couple of weeks ago, and asked them how they're using writing and reading in their workplace and at homes, and what are their needs relating to things that they need to do or that they're dreading. And one of them needed to write a letter to the hospital asking about Billman, uh, Bill, Bill um, being overbilled, basically, for a hospital stay. Another one asked to help explain dementia to a seven-year-old. And, and another one asked, like they asked really interesting use cases. Another one just asked about recipes that they could cook for dinner based upon the ingredients in their fridge, which is a new use case, by the way, if you're not listening to the Hard Fork podcast by Kevin Roos and others, I strongly recommend it, New York Times. Uh, the new version of Bing, which has GPT-4 built into it, that they're playing with allows you to take a picture of your fridge and then ask, okay, well, what should I cook tonight based upon the ingredients available? <laughs> you don't even have to type in any words. It'll read the fridge and it'll tell you what to cook. So here's what we see in the uh, chat feed in terms of use cases and use. We have a lot of people using it in this group. So um, the use cases range from, and I have to read these because these are sort of fascinating. Um, please go to your chat feed as well if you're in the live call. Um, folks have, number one, uh, using it for lesson planning and for finding text, for writing letters to Congress, for um, looking up answers to existing class assignments. I do this as well with our faculty. So let's run through your course and see what are the common assignments and how students might use it. And then how might we shift the assignment so that they can use AI in positive terms to complete it rather than in ways that take away the cognitive work from their um, plates. Anyway, um, we've got um, using it in class for students to discuss how it's used. Thank you for that. Um, playing with it, um, thinking about UDL or universal design for learning. It is okay, but limited. We'll get into that as we continue. Um, using it for personal use, developing story ideas for my ADHD brain and how it can relate or how I can rewrite prose into poetry, et cetera. So keep sharing your ideas as we go. Please talking, uh, continue talking with each other um, directly. And I won't be able to summarize the full chat feed, but um, I want you to continue this discussion and reach out to people in the room as we continue to see this tool evolve. So in terms of student use, what percentage of your students do you think are using it right now? Please put in the chat feed your thought. And I'll also say this much, my daughter who is a ninth grader says that her peers are all using it. Um, either this or they're using AI um, paraphrasing tools like Quillbot and um, Cactus and other things that we'll talk about. Writer, I don't know if you've used Writer yet. Anyway, we see 95% LOL, we see 50%, it's hard to know. 
I think to be fair, unless we have frank discussions with our students and we encourage what I um, am promoting, and you probably have already doing this with everything that uh, is happening in your classrooms, which is metacognitive practices, but in particular, transparent use of AI. Like how are we using technology to complete an assignment at each phase of iteration, at each draft? Um, helping students be transparent about it, their use is key. Um, so let's continue on. Quick run through for, for a few slides. If you've never played with the tool, please play with it today. Um, it asks for one of your phone numbers. Um, so share with it a non-Google voice phone number and you'll be able to log in and play with the tool if you haven't already. And ask it a question not relating to teaching and learning, please. Start with it from the place where my, my daughter's friends are using it, which is not actually to cheat. They're just using it because it's fun. They're playing with it all the time. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's ex exploded so quickly. So as a visual on how to get in, uh, the website is chat.openai.com. And it'll look like this when you come into the space, uh, log in and a sign up button. When you come in, I would recommend just connecting through your um, Google account, a personal Google account will work fine. Uh, thank you for adding the address uh, into the chat feed. It'll look something like this. It'll share some examples some capabilities and some limitations, and you can just ask it any question you'd like. Please, even during this workshop, go in and play with it if you have not before. In terms of what the tool is, I'm gonna do a whirlwind tour. Again, this is a tool that went to a million users in five days. Netflix took three and a half years to get to a million users. So rapid, explosive growth with a terrible brand name. It didn't matter. It just exploded. And then within two months, it's hit 100 million users, according to The Guardian. So that's insane growth, exponential growth. Uh, most recently, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen Google announcing that it's going to be rolling out its features in Gmail. It did some workshops with... Um, business sector around how to create a way to work it into Google Docs so they can send a quick um, announcement of any kind in any tone to whoever it wants to. Um, and likewise, we saw Microsoft doing the same thing. It's added it to a number of tools and it's also adding it to its Office apps within 365 Copilot, we see it, but it's going to be included in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, the whole nine yards. So. Um, whether we like it or not, uh, my sense is at least that this version of the AI is here to stay. Um, we also see AI image generators, for those of you curious, that are also built out by OpenAI, which allow you to um, create a AI-generated image very quickly. We have AI to video. Uh, one of the students on our panel for um, our retreat showed a video to our chancellor and said, hey, this is you. I took me you know, nine minutes of voice data and a photo, and I created a, vid a fake video of you talking, and uh, he shared the video during our retreat. It was fascinating. So we're going to see AI created video. Google also recently came out with the ability to have text to video uh, built in that was featured on one of our nightly shows in the past week. Uh, but this image in particular is an image of the Pope wearing a fancy jacket using a tool that's built into Discord. Um, it was free. I think they've changed their pricing model uh, after everyone went wild about it. Um, I don't know if folks are using this tool. Is anyone using MidJourney? Jessica Weaver Kenny just mentioned it and uses it. And um, there's a bunch of tools like this. We're going to see more. Um, we also see big letters coming out from people with big names who may be heavily critiqued, like Elon Musk, for the way that he runs Twitter. But all the same, he has signed off on um, letters with other notable people saying, please do not advance the AI beyond ChatGPT 4.0. And there's fair arguments for all positions. And so I just want to acknowledge that here before we go further. This review is looking at 3.5 and 4. Again, for my talk today, ChatGPT 3.5 and 4. Um, so core terms to remember, generative AI, it's just one word at a time might be text, code, simulation, images, video, audio, et cetera, based upon the corpus of knowledge on the web with some filtering. LLMs are large language models, uh, began pretty recently at Google Brain in 2017. Um, and there's been lots of models. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details because I'm not a data scientist to be quite frank. I will say that 3.5 was the free version. And when I saw that it was the new electricity, 
hard to explain, but wow. Um, what's that quote about science that anything sufficiently advanced technologically wise is, is uh, indistinguishable from magic? I don't know whose quote that is, but I should figure that out. Anyway, it's magical and exciting and a little bit overwhelming. Chat GBT 4.0 is the version you pay 20 bucks for a month right now. Much better, much more thoughtful, and actually a lot slower. Um, it is a tool, but it's also an engine built into other tools. And so that's something to keep in mind, including tools like Bing, uh, that um, is the Microsoft Edge browser. Uh, someone wrote Arthur C. Clarke in the chat feed. Thank you, David Vasquez. All right, so continuing on, let me see if um, another thought is what tools is it, is it being used in conjunction with already? If you Google this question, you'll see dozens and dozens. Um, but it's, you know, our students are able to use basic 3.5, generate text, and then drop that text into another tool like Quillbot, and then have that paraphrase it even further to make it less, you know, less clearly written by an AI. If there's an AI watermark, those things can disappear if you run it through a number of filters. So Quillbot is pretty well known among the writing community. Writing teachers have had to face this for a while now. Um, it allows you to take any text that is arguably um, jargony or filled with the um, language of power and retranslate it into something that actually makes sense. So this is a tool that can be used for positive ways or negative ways for helping students access complex texts and make sense of Michel Foucault, if you will. So Writer is a similar tool um, that I can share links to. Um, a good friend of mine has done a wonderful review of this tool, which, um, allows you to choose the language, choose whether or not you want to be convincing or candid or casual, choose, um, you know, Farsi, English, Dutch, etc., and write it as a blog post, a business pitch, etc. It's a very robust tool outside. It has nothing to do with ChatGPT, but it's used in conjunction with it. Um, we'll also see Cactus. One of our department heads mentioned that um, her niece was using this tool in middle school, writes essays. It can, it, the previous version was able to convert YouTube's uh, videos into essays without even watching the video. I don't know if that tool is still available, but these tools are evolving constantly. There's even browser extensions for them. So we're going to see a lot of rapid fire change. It's going to be hard to keep track. Um, in terms of tools that currently use ChatGPT 4.0 as an engine, Bing is the most important thing to be aware of. Uh, you can get it on your phone as an app, or you can download Microsoft Edge. People, believe it or not, are starting to do this. Um, and look something like this. I can pose a question up to a thousand words and um, it will give me a quick response in real time. It's combing the web in real time, unlike ChatGPT 3.5, which was limited. It had a cutoff date um, back in 2021, so it couldn't do contemporary stuff. But Bing, which is 4.0, um, has this, you know, this new functionality that's giving Google a hard time. Like, are we going to stop saying, let's Google it, and we'll say, let's Bing it? I think that's probable or possible. We, we will see. But this is the question I posed into Bing. I can do a general search, or I can have a conversation using Bing. This is something of uh, what it looks like. It'll say, hello, I'm, this is Bing. I'm happy to help with your query. And it gave me five AI tools that I can use, uh, including Grammarly, which is an AI, believe it or not, to some degree, or Quillbot or other tools that I am not familiar with. And you'll notice it also includes at the bottom footnotes. Are these footnotes legit or are they hallucinated? That's sort of like Wikipedia. The new digital literacy suggests that students are gonna to need to research this tool the same way and make sure that sources are legitimate. Um, Google's Bard, as somebody notes in the chat feed, is in beta right now and it's coming to, it's actually off of beta. You can join the wait list today. I am using the tool right now um, it's just added coding this past week, the ability to do coding, and it is a lot safer, a lot less likely to do something egregious, but um, not as dynamic. And so we'll see what happens as it moves forward. They did do a bad rollout of Bing, or excuse me, of Bard. Google lost, I think, $100 million, 7% market share, um, just with an error in their presentation. So they're being more careful and cautious with their rollout but it's just as powerful and arguably, some people say it's, it might be more powerful. I'm not really sure. Um, keep in mind with GPT 4.0, it's already being used within Khan Academy. You can join their wait list and um, start playing with a tool that's underneath it. 
and it's being used uh, within Duolingo. Um, and you'll see a bunch more. So if you Google what tool is it built into as an engine, that's a whole different ballgame. We're not going to talk about that today as we speak. We're going to dig into chat GPT itself and the 3.5 version mainly, because that's the one that our students can afford for free. They're not going to pay 20 bucks like me to get 4.0. They're going to most likely use the free version, but they might. And so it's worth looking at both as we continue. Um, have we ever faced similarly, similarly disruptive technologies that make us think, okay, well, what's the purpose of writing a paper? Are we overusing writing as an instrument to assess cognition? I'm a writing teacher, so this is a dilemma for me. Of course it is. How is the teaching of writing going to shift? One of our uh, students on the panel said to the chancellor, you know what, I think we need to have a class in prompt engineering, a degree in that, because that's what people in the future are going to need. Another student said, do we need to be specialists or do we need to be generalists? Do we just need to know how to use the tool to get knowledge? How is learning going to change? We need to engage our students in these questions alongside our administration. Everybody has to engage with these questions. Um, and Jessica is pointing out the cost thing as an equity issue. Absolutely. Thank you, Jessica, for, for raising that point. Um, if I could, for the, for the um, folks that are moderating this, please put in the chat feed how many minutes we have left. So I want to stay on track. I have the capacity to digress. And just if you could throughout, that would be helpful. So the disruption that happened in 2009 for our math educators was Wolfram Alpha. Suddenly we had to rethink how we teach math. Are we looking at summative products where they get the final answer? Or are we actually trying to think about how do we assess each level of learning at each step iteratively so that they explain their problem solving as we move? Um, Math teachers have had to do it. Now we kind of have to do something similar. We have to rethink how we're teaching. I wanted to spend some time as we started giving you a preview of the tool so you know how it works. We've got about 15 minutes, so I'm going to fly through um, some examples here. And if you want to follow up afterwards, please feel free to reach out. Let's dive in. So if you want to learn more, I will share into the chat feed a talk that I did, uh, I guess it was last week for Truckee Meadows, which was focused on what all of this stuff is. In terms of our work, again, I'm looking beyond user experience towards pedagogical experience. How do we use it as teachers and learners? I believe all tech can be a gatekeeper, a gate opener, or it can be a, a gate buster, a gate, um, like different ways. Technology is, new, is neutral. It can be positive or negative, depending on the context. But we need to make sure that the technology aligns with our principles. Whatever your core beliefs about teaching and learning are, we need to align them and our use of them. And that includes chat GPT and how we introduce that, how we communicate that with our student transparently. Um, I'm interested in what are the most and least equitable design features of the tools. We're going to dive in right now. So um, as we explore, continue to use the chat feed to talk with each other. My framework for analysis comes from a piece that I wrote in Campus Technology called 14 Equity Considerations for Ed Tech. Um, because uh, you know, we, we need more ways of thinking about technology. And this is just a starting point as a framework. Uh, you may have other questions that are important, but the ones that I bring utilize an acronym called TAXI, where we examine four different kinds of equity considerations, tech equity, accessibility equity, experiential equity, and identity equity. And my approach during this workshop will be to share ideas uh, as it relates to AI for teaching and learning. And how does it impact our students' access to online learning, to their sense of identity, their belonging, the whole nine yards, whatever comes to your mind when you think of equity, that's what we need to be thinking about. And how do we ensure that it's usable and re relevant, not just for a few, but for all of the students who might walk in our doors. So let's dive in. Um, continue to share ideas in the chat feed as we move forward. I began with this prompt. I asked ChatGPT to do the work for me. Using the article that, I pasting, that I'm pasting below, please review ChatGPT or any parallel questions that are connected with the 14 question taxi framework that I introduce. As an output, please create a table that includes equity as a topic, equity questions. I guess I was using voice to text when I typed this in, so my apologies. But you see, it didn't even matter if I did spelling wrong or if I got the grammar wrong. It still gave a great summary. Um, it created a table um, and I said, okay, that's a pretty good table, but I want you to actually rank yourself on a one to five scale. So it gave me a ranking. Uh, you can see four main categories, tech equity, accessibility equity, experiential equity, and identity equity, and it gave itself three to five stars. Is that fair? I'm not sure. Let's take a closer look at tech equity. 
Um, as we're talking, I want to know what matters to you. So please put those questions, those ideas in the chat feed for this first category. But I'll give some examples of what I'm looking at. So um, I'm interested in, you know, things that might be changed, the tool to make it actually better for us and the, the, the limits of the tool right now. So I asked it, you know, where are the rooms for improvement and how do you review, your, review yourself? Um, I asked it probably a series of questions because sometimes it doesn't give you what you want. So you have to ask it another question. And so I asked it about the questions of my article. It came up with adaptive text-based interface as a feature that it has, but a room for improvement is number one, it fails to optimize for low bandwidth. Number two, it doesn't fully support assistive devices. Number three, it doesn't have an easily navigable user interface. So fascinating stuff. Um, I wanted more. So I said, please include all 14 equity questions that are in my article. And it dug into tech equity looking just at broadband, which is a broadband equity or a broadband privilege is a question. And it acknowledges that it fails to optimize on low bandwidth devices. In terms of tech equity, it acknowledges that, yeah, if students have different devices, um, actually, I didn't quite get that right. It's looking at assistive devices. What I'm saying is that we have different devices on any data educational technology. Do all these apps support a range of, of, of devices? So it's getting things close. Um, I talk, ask it about usability, and I ask it about Pocketbook. And it has the nerve to say five stars. Again, 3.5 is free for everybody, but 4.0 is not. And so it's kind of a problematic to have a two-tiered system with a product that's better that costs more. Um, but here's what I said to the tool. It strikes me that it may be challenging for you to be self-critical as I do not notice any one-star items in your review so far. And so I asked it to go back to the drawing board. And I also said, you know what? As we look at tech equity, we need to think deeper about back-end questions like data equity. How safe and secure and compliant are these tools as it relates to K-12 and higher ed regulations? Uh, could it be potentially hacked in this time of ransomware? And other types of tech equity questions like you know, hiring and sourcing within the company. Do they have a front-facing page relating to equity at their institution? Um, are they using equitable pricing models that are transparent? Are they interoperable? This is just me posing a really kind of complex question. This is 4.0 that I posed it to. It gathered that knowledge and revisited. I think we're getting a little bit of audio feedback here. Not a big deal. Hopefully you can still hear me. Okay. You can, yes. Great. So, um, just see here. Give me two seconds. Okay. Um, so here's what it said. It's, it looked at COPA, uh, COPA com compliance. It looked at uh, GDPR, so commu uh, secure uh, communication. And it, it kind of gave a better review. It said three out of five. It said it needs to, to improve its transparency and security measures to ensure equity. Um, another deeper dive, it said, that it lacks public information on internal comfort, company hiring sources and equitable practices. And as you're choosing your educational technologies, these are things we're looking at. But I was glad that it was able to give honest reviews relating to uh, these pieces. It did say, well, it does have a commitment to inclusivity and ethical AI development. So I was glad that it at least puts that out there. Um, transparent pricing, it looked at the freemium model and it gave it a two star this time saying, ah, the product does or should ensure equitable access to features and prioritize more transparent and inclusive practices. So this is fascinating for me. Um, I'm gonna jump through these a little bit fa faster, but you know, interoperability is a question. Do these tools make us stuck with them once we adopt them, or can we migrate to other platforms when we need to? These are institutional equity questions. Are we going to be stuck with a tool and be facing uh, price increases once we've got it? Um, in terms of accessibility equity, similar questions, I wanna know what matters to you in the chat feed. Uh, please share your ideas of things that matter around access. Um, I don't know that we have time to go into the tool, but if we could hear from Peralta Equity, how many minutes do we have left at this point? We have uh, 10 minutes, but that includes time for questions and answers. Okay, so I'm gonna fly through this and you'll at least see what we were going to cover. But the spirit of this that I would encourage you all to do is, Please, whatever framework you're using, you can use some of the ideas from my article. You can create your own, preferably, of what are the things that matter to you as it relates to equity. But create a way to analyze these tools and think about how you're going to roll them out of your institutions. Even if it's thinking about 
should you ban the tool or not? Uh, of course, I'm not a big fan of banning tools because that just makes them more exciting for our students. I want to engage our students as thought leaders and help them contribute to the discussion. But all the same, uh, the goal in this particular piece is to say, well, we have a role to play in analyzing the tool as it is and thinking about how we can use it um, in equitable ways at our institutions. So I talk about exper experiential equity. We're not going to dig into the tool. Identity equity is another frame that I bring up in my essay. We're not gonna go into those matters. I'm closing with a summative review. Um, when I asked it to review itself, it gave it one stars because I asked it to. I said, look, you're being too positive. So it revisited and it slammed itself. It said, look, uh, we don't have as much device, um, you know, we can't use it on a broad range of devices. We're not transparent. We don't have great multilingual support and inclusivity, um, et cetera. And for me, I said, well, you're being pretty critical. You're giving me what I want, but maybe you're not actually being honest with me because I see a bunch of one-star ratings. It revisited it and gave a more balanced review of itself saying, well, what are current specific features and what are things that it can do to improve? And um, then I asked it for a summary of its strengths. This is how it summarized itself um, in terms of its making strides, and it is, and mitigating bias and being very open about its modeling. Um, it has a whole document of all the ways in which they've tried to hack the tool that they've publicly posted just to be transparent about their design process. They're designing with us as they proceed. Um, shortcomings, GPT itself says it uh, has limits in terms of equitable design, tech support has issues, uh, content filtering requires improvement to protect users, the model lacks customization for individual learning paths and has limited teacher-centric features, device compatibility and optimization for low-end devices are areas where the tool could be enhanced. And then I asked it this final question, for which it said, for schools aiming to utilize ChatGPT equitably, it's a crucial to develop supplemental resources and practices. I agree with this fully. Provide comprehensive training and support for both teachers and students to ensure students or all users can benefit from the tool regardless of their technical proficiency. Establish clear guidelines for content generation and curation to prevent the inclusion of harmful or inappropriate material. Create Additional instructional materials to supplement ChatGPT focus on culturally responsive and diverse content. Finally, consider strategies for integrating the tool within the existing instructional frameworks, making accommodations for learners with varying abilities and, and backgrounds. These are, again, this is just me having a conversation with a tool, but I was pleasantly surprised with, with um, how effective the summary was at getting the, the ideas going. You know, we're encouraging our faculty to communicate better with students uh, to have syllabus statements. We've even used ChatGPT to create syllabus statements um, to not take a punitive approach. Uh, if you'd like to see a talk on um, how to respond to AI cheating, I do a, a panel with Packback, the uh, ed tech company that discusses the problematics of taking these turnitin.com or Packback or um, chat or GPT zero evaluations too seriously. It's useful to know what percentage of the tool seems to be, uh, or the writing that we're doing seems to be AI generated. But as noted recently from the noted, um, oh, what's his name? Is the Wharton School? He was speaking to ASU GSV last week, and he basically is saying, you know, if you have a sophisticatedly sophist sufficiently complicated query, it's really hard for any tool to know that it is is generated by an AI if you know how to pose the question in a complex way. So let's open this up for q and I'd like you to use the chat feed if possible, given the time. Uh, we have about five minutes remaining. Again, there's a lot of issues. It reproduces what is on the web. So one thing you'll notice that they didn't say in the review is, um, I'm going to reproduce, or at least, you know, I'm speaking as if I was ChatGPT. ChatGPT has and will reproduce the biases of the web. It will reproduce the selected readings of syllabus that might be biased. It will reproduce the, um, even the image generators will, and I learned this from one of our faculty yesterday. She said she used it to create an image for a party with her last name and it generated all people that were white even though her family is diverse. So there's gonna be dynamics in which the tool reproduces the best and the worst of what's on the web. Um, let's see what questions we have. Copyright issues is one coming in from Leanne. Thank you. It's a huge question. I should note that in terms of authorship, 
um, we see the journal Nature and the journal Science posting uh, publicly what their position is on whether or not you can co-publish with AI. There currently are peer-reviewed articles published that say written by, you know, my name, Reed Dixon, and ChatGPT. So, and then there's others that say, no, you can't do that. But you do need to be transparent about how you're using the AI within your um, within your writing. And so check those out, uh, the journal Science and the journal Nature. Great question on copyright. And I don't know that the answer is simple, to be quite frank. Uh, we don't ask folks to mention Grammarly when we're asking about what they submit. But as teachers, in particular, maybe we need to be thinking about this. Um, you know, like when are we using educational technology to support our learning? And what questions are we posing to it? What are we building upon? What is original work that is ours, et cetera? Uh, so other questions coming in the chat feed, I think we have just a couple minutes. And I'm also gonna post in some links for the group that might be relevant to a lot of the stuff that I've shared today. You'll see it here. If Peralta could reshare this, that would be great. You'll see it appear in a moment, just like 10 different links. So um, tonight, we continue diving into the debate over uh, chat bot cheating. I somehow article, triggered, or maybe some people really triggered one of those videos. Generate human like responses. Hang Millions on. of students trying it out, some using it to produce for yeah, school. Paper, could use the, 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 the bands. Okay, wonderful. So, thoughts, ideas. Again, we are educators in the room. Some of us might be product designers. What are your thoughts about these kinds of questions as it relates to equity? What are the takeaways that might be useful in the chat feed? Do you have classes for your faculty where they get to analyze educational technology and think about the pedagogical uses of them? Is that something you're interested in? Are you looking at introducing ChatGPT in a different way? Do you have any shifts in what you're thinking about the tool based upon this presentation? If you could share in the chat feed, whatever comes to mind. So Nita talks about the impact on assessment. First person in our um, round table yesterday said, my assessment office is gonna be packed. She's concerned about that. Is everyone gonna wanna come in and return to proctored examination. I did a panel for 70 instructional designers through EduCause a couple of weeks ago, and one person mentioned, are we going to return to blue books? Please tell me we're not. I get anxious about just the idea of my hand cramping up in a blue book. Um, but we will see both directions, more proctoring, more um, blue books, and more invasive proctoring solutions that go into students' homes, asking them to, you know, to to take a high stakes test, that's a concern. We can go in positive directions here and make more authentic assessments, or we can go in the direction of learning that actually is more top-down, uh, more banking model, more regurgitating what the teacher said, more high stakes. That's my concern, is that we react in a knee-jerk way and, and, um, and move away from authentic assessment, ironically. But I do feel, and I've seen it at our college, that our faculty are moving towards rethinking assessment, rethinking uh, transparent tech practices, transparent AI practices, et cetera. Um, we've got a couple of the comments coming through the chat feed more than I can see. Um, Jessica mentions we've been discussing guidelines for faculty, but this makes me realize how it is, important it is to, uh, to incorporate guidelines on equity when using these tools. I, in the spirit of, of Peralta's equity conference, I'm so glad that um, that's one of the takeaways because I think we sometimes overlook that in our tech um, reviews in deciding which text to, to make into um, college-wide solutions. Unfortunately, um, we are out of time. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> we could probably go on with this subject for hours. I mean, it's such a fascinating subject. And Reed, we really appreciate your presentation. And thank you for posting the links. Um, that is some valuable information that we can all explore. I just want to remind everyone that the recording for this presentation and all the other sessions will be on our YouTube channel. I put that link in the chat. Um, 
Also, uh, you can refer to the schedule for day one to see all of the other sessions that are available this e afternoon. And I just want to remind you to participate uh, by looking on our social media. We have a Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook page. So it is time to move on to our next host. But once again, Reed, thank you so much for presenting at our conference. My pleasure. And please, if possible, share some feedback in this little Google form I dropped in the chat feed. It's always useful to know what's helpful. And uh, we'll see you all throughout the conference. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>